right, this is Final Draft, and I'm here with... Mando Pony. And today we have a very special guest, a very important guest, one Mr. Will Anderson. It's great to be here, guys. Well, and I just wanted to start off with a basic question I ask all members of the production staff. How did you get involved with My Little Pony? I was asked, there was a limited submission uh, list of composers being considered for the underscore or background music score. It was by invitation only, not what we call a cattle call. And everybody got the same test piece of animation to work on. And I scored it and sent it in. And then they listened to it blind. In other words, they didn't know what composer wrote what piece when they were listening to them. And from the, I think it was about five selections, uh, people that they had invited to submit for the series, mine was picked. They liked mine the best and I got the job. Well, that's awesome. I would have picked you as well, just to be completely honest. Hmm. Well, you never know. <laughs> so you obviously work on My Little Pony. Do you want to talk a little bit about all of the other amazing stuff you've worked on? I'm looking at everything you've done here, and it's a huge list. It is. <laughs> I'm an animation scoring monster. I love writing music. The road into animation was just a road that happened and I just started marching down it and I still do features and, you know, I've done reality shows and news shows and radio shows and lots of commercials. But over the years, my mainstay of business has been in animation. Well, so when you've been working with animation, what have been your real big musical influences? I mean, working with that as a media, is there a certain style of music that you try to work towards? Or are there certain genres that you reference? I got into it quite by accident. And so I really didn't have any formal preparation or knowledge of rules or how things were done when I started. My first hit show was a show called Biker Mice from Mars. And I had just done something for uh, Mike Young called PJ Sparkles. It was a little girl's show. It was just a half hour special. It was the first animated special I think I had done. And I wrote the songs and score. And he said a friend of his was developing a show called Biker Mice from Mars. Did I have anything? And I wrote a, a theme and the, the producer Rick Young loved, uh, um, Rick Unger rather, loved it. Played it a thousand, well, he, he said he had played it 26 times and then he had to call me and tell me how great it was. And <laughs> I mean, really, he, he was, he, he just thought, who are you? How did you do this? And um, are you a wizard? <laughs> yeah, you know, and so he made a one minute piece of um, animation to go with the thing that I wrote and sold it. And it became a big hit. And we went on to do 65 episodes. And I scored them all, and it was on that show that I really learned by just doing, uh, you know, what worked for me in animation. And since then, I've become, of course, much more aware of all the talented composers and different ways to approach music. And I've watched uh, styles evolve and different ways of doing things happen. It's, it's been an interesting journey. What was your training in music before you got into scoring? Did you go to college to study music theory, or where did you come from musically? I played in, in, in a lot of bands. I played in Weird Al's band and recorded with Weird Al and toured with Weird Al for a few years, and we did a lot of styles of music. I played in original bands in the Los Angeles area. Those were kind of like my punk rocker days. Nice. <laughs> I went to UCLA and studied theater and scoring for film. My degree is from UCLA, and so I learned a lot about or orchestration and theory and conducting and writing for film specifically there. Sort of a wide-ranging education, I think. Well, it almost seems, especially if you're coming from a background working with Weird Al, that a combination of that goofier style with the more serious film scoring background really is appropriate for the show for My Little Pony because it does have those two elements. Yeah, we go all over the place, don't we? I would say overall, our sound, and it's funny, I've come to refine how I look at it. You know, we do primarily an orchestral score, and I like to keep it linear and help it tell the story and unintrusive a lot of times. I want it to be, I want it to support and be there, you know, and help the story and be somewhat invisible. And then of course we have set pieces where we go all out. And then we have a, you know, handful of character music situations where 
oh, I forget the name of the the German fashion designer. You know, I, oh, I went photo to, finish. I think right. You know, that was photo more finish. like. Uh, oh, I loved that music. Yeah, this is a, a progressive house kind of thing. And then, you know, we that Dragon episode, I think it just aired a couple. Yes, I was just about to ask about that. I loved the rock music that played in the back. It was awesome. I, I really banged out some new metal thrash, and I had to tone a couple of things down. I forget if it was Woody or, <laughs> Woody or Jason. I forget which one was like, come on, Will, we can't go that far. <laughs> you know, yeah, it was banging. Now that That's awesome. We also have that guitar riff that you use for Rainbow Dash. It seems like in any scene she's in where she's, I don't know, flying around kicking ass, you've got the dun 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 dun, dun going in the background, which I think really helps with that feel. We used to. You know what? We're using that less and less as we go forward. Is that a decision made from the studio, or was that something that you decided to change? Hasbro has just let me go. I mean, not in a bad way. That's awesome. I don't think I've had one note on the music from Hasbro in, in 15, 16, 17 episodes. They just approve everything I do. It's got to be a huge sigh of relief. It's just great. It's great. And, and Woody and Jason, they're the directors. They're much more exacting and, you know, they'll, they'll tickle things. And can we slide this earlier in this? And this is, feels a little, you know, I, I do a round of revisions. I, the process is I sit down and we spot it. Then I score it. I make a movie with the score in it, and they give me some notes back. We've got it down to where there's not a whole lot of notes anymore. I, I call them tickles. And then we make <laughs> the tickles, and, and I send it off to Dick and Rogers, and they do their usual fabulous job mixing it. So after spotting, do they not have time to put together a temp track? Oh, there's temp music in there sometimes. Not all the time. In fact, rarely. And sometimes I'll go with it. Uh, and sometimes I express my feeling that it's wrong because sometimes it is wrong and we decide to do something else. They, you know, they don't put in a lot of uh, attempt music anymore unless it's something very specific, like Woody wanted to use the Wagner Flight of the Valkyries in that, in that mm -hmm. one episode some time back. And so I did a version of that that was very specific. I remember hearing that the fans kind of absolutely loved that as soon as like, oh, I know that music, where, where it came from. So as far as the actual scoring process goes for My Little Pony, I know that a lot of film composers are sort of afraid of working on TV because it's such a tight schedule. How tight is the schedule on this show? It's, ex it's extremely tight. I always tell people that animation scoring, weekly episodic animation scoring is the hardest gig in the business. It's probably fortunate for me that it was the first big recurring episodic assignment I had because I got used to working so hard. You have basically one week to score the entire episode, make the revisions for the director, and then master it and deliver it to the post house. For 26 weeks in a row, you have to keep going, maybe with a break here or there if there's a holiday. It's brutal. Yeah, and I think sometimes the really frustrating part, like you said, is oh, well, frustrating and gratifying at the same time. You said you kind of have to be invisible. It's like if you do your job perfectly, nobody will really notice, or they, they might notice, oh, the music is really pretty, but it's all about enhancing the story, not distracting from it. I love doing that. And it's about not getting lead and also it's neat the way it'll flow, flow. The orchestration needs to change along the way. Like you might have some kind of thing going on with clarinets and woodwinds and then at a certain turn and it brings up, you know, you'll switch to pizzicato violins with some maybe other pitched percussion underneath it. And then it gets into a big moment. So you swell in some some brass and orchestral cymbals or or something and you want to be invisible, but you also don't want it to have a clarinet noodling about for 40 seconds you know it needs to constantly be moving or else it, by virtue of it always staying the same it starts to draw attention to itself that's what's so fun about the linearity of the approach of the orchestral underscore approach well i think that you're absolutely right that the music tends to support the scenes and is there in the background but there are moments in the show actually where that background music helps define a scene and i'm thinking of one moment in particular right now and i think a lot of fans know what I'm about to mention, which is when Trixie appears in that one season one episode, there's a fanfare that really has become associated. <laughs> I love that. Right. 
yeah, it's it's really become associated with the character. And they reused that sound in, uh, I think it was Luna Eclipse, and everybody instantly associated that with Trixie again. And so I was wondering if that was an intentional decision on your part to make it distinctive like that, or if that's something that just kind of comes about naturally. It comes about naturally. I'm a very just intuitive. You know, I have so much work to do every every week. I, I just have to get through it and make it work. And some things become defined over time, like the harpsichord-based theme for rarity is one of the most, I mean, whenever I get to rarity, I just hear that and we do something like that and it just fits under her. Not all the characters have themes as defined as hers. Like, like Twilight doesn't really have that sort of clarity in her thematic thing. And it's just sort of the way it ended up for her. You know, it's funny. Well, and I would also just like to mention that uh, our staff artist actually uses that Trixie fanfare as a notification sound for his cell phone whenever he gets a text message. I think that some of those sounds really do help define the characters in a sense. I always find an author's voice and a signature sound or endeavor to uh, for whatever series I'm working on. It needs to have a voice and a sound all of its own. And sometimes that can just be subtle in the approach and the writing. And sometimes it can be a specific style of music. And sometimes it can be a thematic material that you use again and and again and again and again. I was reading out there in the blogosphere, someone was talking about Hanna-Barbera and how they heard the same cues used in one show to another. I responded and Hanna-Barbera erred a little too much on the thrifty side about using their library in all of their productions. So you could be watching Yogi Bear or Tomcat or any of those shows of that era and you'd hear the same Johnny Quest action music in many of them and that's not good because you you sort of squander the capital you have the currency you have created the signature sound that you've created for a show and dilute its power by putting it into other shows but within a show i mean it's not like we redesign the characters every week um you know it needs to feel and look and sound like a my little pony show every single week so we 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 should be consistent So for your approach to composing, are you more the kind of person who improvises and then refines, or do you really set out to write a specific melody or a chord progression and then orchestrate it for all of your instruments, or is it sort of a back and forth, scene by scene sort of case? I'm always getting through things in different ways, but overall, the picture is my guide. I can tell if it's working I put the dialogue up, I put the picture up, everything I write, I always have the dialogue and the picture going. And it'll be a question of finding the right instrument that feels good in there. Sometimes I'll noodle around trying to find a right melodic contour, or sometimes I'll just improvise at the piano, finding the right chord structure. I'll generally come up with what I call a sketch for the scene. Say it's a minute and 20 seconds, and it goes from wherever it goes during that minute and 20 seconds. I kind of get my overall approach usually sketched out on piano all the way through and then sometimes along the way i'll i'll add a few little elements like a melody element or a percussive element or i'll start to fill it in a little bit to help define the sense of of the cue and where it needs to go and end up and then i fill it all in the sketch first I try to keep things on the grid, as we say. I use Digital Performer, and it's best to have your conductor tempo map match what you're writing so that when it comes time to shifting elements of music around in the digital realm, you can always know exactly where the beats line up. But sometimes programming the beat gets so tedious that your inspiration gets lost that I'll just play it in without any conductor's click at all because it's easier to get the right feel to hit all the beats and have rubatos and accelerandi and I don't have to worry about trying to just tediously make it work with a click track that's programmed. I don't know if you guys understand what I'm talking about. Oh no, I completely understand what you're talking about. As a musician who records, like I love the click track and hate it at the same time. It keeps me in time, but it really limits performance variables that make it human. That's totally the thing, and, and I'm, I'm a terrific programmer, and I can really get in there and make the tempo map exactly right, and it just comes down to of like, okay, I've got to get about three minutes to five minutes done every single day, and this is driving me nuts, and I can just play this in, 
And if I have to go in there and look at the graphic editor window and line the beats up manually rather than use any sort of soft quantizing function, I, I will just have to right. do that because it's just driving me crazy to, to try to get the rubato uh, p tempo picks up here, um, uh, uh, goes down here. You know, it takes too much time. So sometimes I put it on the grid. Sometimes I don't. But I get the sketch working for the entire bit that I'm working on, and then I fill it in. Sometimes I'll sketch out a whole act and then go and fill out the whole act. Sometimes I'll just do the cue and fill it out. Sometimes I just go and just write the cue. Sometimes I don't even start with a sketch. I hear a melody or I know it's going to be something, and I just start putting it together and I just do it. That's awesome. So now that we've been talking about the tech side of things, which I absolutely adore, you've got to share some of your secrets. What software do you use to compose with? What sort of instruments do you use? Because the sound of the actual instruments and the score itself is delicious every single time. I love the sound of the score. Thank you so much. And uh, I've been to your YouTube page and you're knocking out some pretty good stuff yourself, Mando Pony. So that's a nice compliment. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think he just made his year. You got you got some rock stuff and other some orchestral stuff too. You know some uh, I don't know. There was a bang and rock track for Rainbow, and there was a real neat yeah magical cue with some that started with some Pitts violins, I believe. That was uh, I forget what it was for. It was but was it the Twilight one that I did just recently in seven eight? Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. That's it. That's it. That's it. No, thank you so much, man. I really, really appreciate that. It, thank you. And then the eight bit game music. Yeah, it's so much fun to do. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, like, I, I gotta say, though, as far as 8-bit music goes, I mean, nobody can touch Rainbow Crash 88. Like, he's such a legit 8-bit performer. I just gotta shout out to him. <laughs> but chiptunes are so much fun. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's it's deserved. Uh, my rig is, is uh, I have two rigs. You know, I have my studio up in Toronto where I spend about half the year and half the year down here in Los Angeles where I am now. Both rigs do the same job, but my premier setup is, is down here in Los Angeles. And I use Digital Performer. I have a machine room with um, five PCs and two Mac Pros. But really, I'm just using the one. It's a Mac Pro eight core, three gigahertz machine. It's about five years old. It's got 16 gigs of RAM. And, you know, I've got a couple of SSD drives and then a couple of terabytes of eSATA drives. And that's my main computer rig. And uh, I have two uh, high def displays, the, the Mac one, the overpriced big Mac one, and then a big Samsung. And I use digital performer. I run everything through my, I have an API 1608 analog mixing console and it's a pretty pricey high-end unit and i run everything through it i don't know if you're familiar with the concept of, of summing mixers to make a sound bigger mm -hmm. but i don't use a summing mixer i i use my api 1608 and i also have their 2500 bus compressor on the stereo insert and most everything goes through that and then on all the digital outputs of my sequencer, my digital performer, I have the UAD card in there, the universal audio card with all their plugins on it. And uh, one of the ones I have is the Studer 3200. It's the two inch 24 track modeling plugin they have. And it makes it sound your uh, all your digital stuff like it was recorded on two inch tape. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's Love real, that analog sound. Yeah, it's a real pricey, fat, saturating uh, plug-in from UA. And uh, I put that on all my digital outputs to warm them up, and then I run it through my a Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it gives it a... It, it glues the tracks together a little bit and just makes them sound a little, little fatter. Real nice plug-in. The sounds that I use, most of the orchestral material is done with the East-West Symphonic Orchestra, the uh, Quantum Leap Symphonic Orchestra Library. I have the Platinum Plus version, but I also have a lot of Vienna stuff as well, Vienna orchestral uh, right, stuff. Right, right. It's very good. I also have Symphobia 1, Symphobia 2, 
I have many, many other things that I don't really use too much on this show. A lot of the native instruments, things like Absinthe or FM mm -hmm. or Massive. I have Stylus RMX. I have Omnisphere. I have a whole lot of third-party Rex 2 libraries that I buy primarily from places in London and Europe because they seem to get the house electronic thing a lot better than we do in the United States. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you've always got to go to Europe to get that the techno and house stuff. Holland especially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Holland. Like I just did some glitch stuff, uh, Dutch glitch, abstract spoken word stuff for an artist who's having an exhibition, a friend of mine, Tyler Ramsey, and there's films being made for every single new painting that's gonna hang. And one of the things I did is called Second Language, and it's it's all like Dutch, glitch, electronic, and then I have had him come That is amazing. It's fun, it's, it's neat stuff, I like it. And then I had him come over and just do a bunch of riffs on uh, being lost in his head while he was while he paints and i cut those up and processed them and and did stutter edits and echoes and made it sound like it was sweep filters and mixed that all up with kind of this weird glitch thing now is this something that people can maybe find online or look to see in the near future i i posted it on a soundcloud page up for a while somebody emailed me that it was down and i don't know what happened i had some old theme you know so i put earthworm jim and x-men evolution and oh, i loved earthworm jim when i was growing up <laughs> that was a good theme anyway i had a bunch of themes like that those are owned by like universal or sony or warners and maybe there was maybe they had to shut it off because it, it's technically not mine to post on soundcloud i don't know i'll have to look at that when i get back from vacation but i had it up there and you know i have a lot of other neat stuff i have an incredible microphone collection and compressors um vintage rca ribbon microphones and oh wow and well uh, AK beautiful 12, uh, a matching pair of of neumann km84s consecutive serial numbers Vintage Neve mic pre's from the 1064 modules, a Pendulum Audio 6386, which is a meticulous recreation of the Fairchild 670 compressor limiter, a UA1176, uh, a UA LA2, their 610 mic pre, lots of other microphones. And I'm just drooling at the mouth right now. Yeah, I have some pretty high end stuff. Oh, guitars. I have a Fender P bass. I have a, a Stratocaster, a nice Strat. I have a really nice Taylor acoustic. I have a ukulele, a Young Chang piano out in the living room kind of stuff. I have the, oh, the Antelope Valley pendulum clock that puts out house sync for everything. I use the Apogee 16 XD or whatever it is for my analog digital conversion. I stream a lot of the samples that I was mentioning, the East West or the Vienna stuff. I have a second mm -hmm. slave computer, which is a PC. It's got Windows 7 64 bit, which is a really good operating system. I don't know why they're changing. I know, right? Yep, that's what I'm running on too. <laughs> what why are they why are they changing it? Because they have to change it all the time. Oh, yeah. Oh. And why did they make Lion? Oh God. <laughs> On the PC, I use it as a slave machine. It's got 24 gigs of RAM. Uh, it's a real fast processor. I forget which one. And it's all SSD drives or 10,000 RPM Western digital drives or were they Seagate Barracudas? I don't know, but all really fast drives. And all it does is stream. I use Vienna Ensemble Pro as the VST AU host in both computers. And uh, I know this is technical, but you asked, and it all streams I love it. Ethernet gigabit, right? Uh, there's no MIDI or audio interfaces. You just awesome. take the, uh, the gigabit uh, Ethernet cable from the Mac Pro, and it goes straight into the PC, and everything runs through that. It's, it's just remarkably fast. I love it. But I will add one thing. Having a lot of toys is fun, and it's something that I enjoy and have enjoyed, and it's one of the perks of being successful as a composer, but writing great music, it's a poor craftsman who blames his tools, and great stuff is so inexpensive now. You can go out and get a keyboard with so many good sounds on it, and you have absolutely no excuse not to write great music on it that sounds terrific. 
there are a lot of musicians in this fandom who, you know, create music that's associated with the show. You know, there's this one guy, Mando Pony or something. I I, I don't know if you've heard. Don't listen to him. He's crazy. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But he and I think all of them are right now drooling at your setup. And I would just ask, you know, Mando, if that if you are drooling, make sure to clean up afterwards. You know, it's me a mess. I'm trying my best over here. Have you gotten a chance to use the precision bass or your Stratocaster or the Taylor on the show itself? I've recorded some acoustic guitar and and some lead stuff on the Strat. Some of that, uh, you know, that metal stuff was a combination of uh, Ministry of Rock and stuff I just played live. It's hard to, I, I, it's a shame. I'm always bummed. I look at all this fabulous outboard gear and instruments I have and converters and microphones and i you know i'm you know i really wish i had more time to use them there's really not a a lot of time like daniel gets to take a lot of time with his songs and go to studios and record big choirs and and you know really do a good mix and and just work a song at a time i got a lot to do in a week it takes a lot of time to set up and properly track and mix live players on the schedule that i have I was going to ask about that. When you compose the music for the episodes, are you given a, say, muted animation reel that you work off of? Or are you given storyboards that you then compose off of? I'm just wondering, when is it in the process of creating the episode that you compose the background music for the episode? The composer in animation is considered part of post-production. And all of us in post, the ADR guys, the effects editors, the composers. We don't start our jobs in earnest, uh, and, and I have to qualify it, but, but we don't really get going on it until we have the locked print. And a locked print is when it's cut to time, and that means it's exactly the way it's going to be on TV. And there is a time code that it's uh, 23976, 23.976 frames a second, and there's a big what's called a window burn. And it starts at, you know, zero, 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 and rolls all the way through to about 22 minutes. And where there's a commercial, they slug in a piece of black and it says commercial here. And all the final dialogue is there. The dialogue will be on the left side. And then whatever temp music or uh, temporary effects they have put in will be on the right side. And that's at my insistence. I, I like to split those things out so I can mute them and just have the dialogue and the picture up when I'm composing. Um, That makes sense. Yeah. And so that what I write fits exactly with what is seen on TV. I write specifically for the final edit of the show. I mean, that's what scoring is about. Is there a certain episode or two that stand out in your mind that were the most fun for you to work on? Or do you have a favorite episode in general that you worked on or that you've seen after it's been finished? You know, the very first episode with that long storytelling sequence was a lot of fun to do just because it was the first show. There's just little things. Okay, you know, when Pinky goes nutso and is talking to the rocks in that one episode of party, I love that scene. It's so abstract and the music is so weird. I liked some of the stuff we did for Discord, the backwards. I, I, I took a bunch of things and mangled them and had them played backwards and threw them in. Some of that was good. Granny's story, when she was telling her story to the school kids, and I forget the names of the episodes, and and Sweetie Belle, or is that her name? Um, I think you're thinking you know, maybe who, Apple Bloom or... Uh, yeah, the little, you know, Applejack's little girl sister thingy. <laughs> uh, she, she, she uh, you know, had been so embarrassed about Grandma, but she was so proud of her then. And and she told the whole story, her whole background story. I loved the music in that story. I thought it was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, that that's that's a tremendously scored scene. Um, I have two guys on my team, Mark Perlman and Christopher Gee. Wouldn't be fair for me not to mention him, especially with that scene. He was such a tremendous help, and we're quite a team. We work together a lot, and and on that, I, I think that scene is just so damn good. So, th- so that was a good one. Some of the epic battle scenes, you know, I mean, we spend forever on those. <laughs> They're so hard. <laughs> it's like it never ends. You just run out of time. Well, and I especially love that scene as well, where Pinky 
Pi has gone crazy and she's talking to the rocks and the sack of flour. And, and she has those moments where she tweaks, you know, she does that kind of tweaking motion. And, and there's this cacophonous brass sound that comes in, you know, that brrr noise. It just it, it worked really well. Yeah, yeah, it's a good scene. I wanted to ask what your general reaction has been to the surprising and unexpected brony phenomenon. When did you first find out that the show had become an online phenomenon? And what has been your overall reaction to it? I was very late to the party understanding what was going on. I was too busy working and I heard people say, you know, the show's catching on and it's a big hit and there's people calling themselves bronies and I thought that was, you know, cool and good. <laughs> Everybody wants their show to be successful. But it never hit me in the face until really this season. I mean, there was an artist on Deviant Art. All of a sudden I saw a caricature of myself as a pony on the interwebs. And it was obviously taken from the picture of my homepage on my website. And it was really, really well done. And I was flattered. And at the top of it, it said, your music will never fade into the background. And um, I just thought that was so cool. And so I made a point to figure out who who, who did that. There's this guy named Edmund. He's in, he's in Malaysia. And he, he was a member of Deviant Art. And I went to go thank him. And I had to join Deviant Art to thank him. And after I thanked him, like, all of a sudden, my page had 2,000 hits or something, like in 10 hours. And uh, the editor of Film Scoring Monthly called and said, was that you? Uh, really thanking him. And I said it was. And and so it was, you know, you know, uh, um, I mean, that was when I realized, gosh, you know, um, this is a real vibrant community that's really alive. Uh, and other things, you know, when I would hear about like the BronyCon in New York going on and uh, stuff like that, it caught me completely by surprise. It, it, I had no idea. Well, and you recently announced, I think, that you were going to be showing up at Everfree Northwest. Is that correct? I would love to go. It's right in the middle of season three. I don't know if, if uh, DHX is going to let me out of my cage. I'm looking at the production schedule, and I think that I can do it, and I want to do it. And I want to make a donation. You know, it's also about helping kids, you know, and I'm all for that. Absolutely. I'm going to send toys anyway. I mean, whether I can make it or not, I'm going to help out. But... It's uh, like I said, you know, I'm on a pretty short leash when we're in production and they, they may not be comfortable and understandably so with me going to the convention. I, d I don't know yet. Well, either way, I think that your re interaction with the fans has really, really been positive. I think that's one of the things that has defined this community has been that production members such as yourself and the animators and then the voice actors have interacted with the online community. And that seems to me to be kind of new. I mean, is this something that you've ever seen before in other fandoms? You know, there's always people that find me and email me about the shows I work on. And some of them have bigger fan bases than other X-Men evolution had a large fan base and people were always asking me for music or what I did. Same thing with earthworm Jim, and same thing with biker mice from Mars. A little bit with Spider-Man. I get emails every week from shows that I've done throughout the years of people just expressing their admiration or asking how I did it or saying they were a fan and, you know, stuff like that. Oh, I can see that. I mean, I, I uh, am... Still, I still consider myself a fan of the Earthworm Jim show and the Weird Al show. I remember that. I used to watch that when I was a kid. Right. And just got to say thank you for the work on both of those personally, because I've been a fan of yours for a very long time, apparently. <laughs> oh, that's that's cool. Yeah. So have you heard much of the music that's been put out by the Brony community? I mean, obviously, there's this Mando Pony guy, but have you heard anything else that's been put out there yet? I don't have a lot of time, uh, but I do go out there and play things. I've sent, I've heard some nice orchestral things and other remixes of stuff I've done, some of the beat stuff I've heard spun out and remixed. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a pilot right now for another big studio and a feature film. And I just finished a musical for some people that are from New York and developing a property for Broadway. And 
Oh, fantastic. Congrats. Yeah. Thank you. These are all large projects. And, you know, My Little Pony in and of itself is a full-time job. And I just finished a couple, I forget when I finished the last episode for this season, but it was, you know, a week or two ago, two weeks ago, something like that. You know, I don't have much time to go listen to everybody's stuff. I don't. No, and I understand that. I was going to mention, though, that one of your background themes that was in, I think, season one has actually gone and had a bit of a life of its own. And I think it's a it's a theme you use when Scootaloo's going around town on her scooter that's kind of been come to known as the Q Mark Crusaders theme. The ba 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 That's right. That's right. And it's kind of yeah. it's kind of taken a life of its own and, and people have been remixing that quite a bit. So I just I wanted to point that out. <laughs> Can I be totally honest? Yes. Yeah, of course. Actually, we uh, tend to Try not to use uh, synthesizers in the show much anymore. There were some people that didn't really like the synthesizers. And for some reason, that one kind of just scooted through. I was just going to say, I don't, I don't, this isn't the, I don't, maybe I shouldn't say it. That's probably one of my least favorite things that I've written for the show. Okay, I said it. <laughs> No, that's fine. It, oh, that always happens, though, doesn't it? Like the stuff that, yeah. that that you really work very, very hard on, nobody really notices. And the ones that you spit out in five seconds, oh, it's my favorite. That's absolutely true. And I want to expound on that for just one second, because it is so true. And I will tell composers that I'm working with or that ask me for advice, I go, you've got to get over yourself because invariably, the cue you work the hardest on for the entire movie or whatever it is you're doing and you put your life and you think it's like the best thing you've ever done. The first thing the director is going to say to you on the phone when he calls up with your notes is that, that you know, I hate that. Get rid of it. And it, it, it is true. And then you do something in five seconds and it like is like it becomes everybody's favorite and you wonder why you work so hard all the time. It just is what it is. I, I, I sometimes think, you know, you sketch fast, make a lot of paintings. That's sort of what we need to do as mm -hmm. background composers. And I do think um, now this isn't the case with epic set pieces. They take forever and they just do. But yeah. sometimes when you work really, really hard on a piece of music, you lose sight of the picture and the dialogue and the meaning and you start getting too involved in writing great music. It's not about writing great music. It's about writing the right music for the scene that works under the dialogue. Absolutely. That kind of reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. I don't mean to interrupt you, but one of my favorite quotes is by a mandolinist named Chris Seeley, where he says, don't play guitar, play music. And that kind of, you just kind of reminded me of that. Uh, if I could mention just real quick, especially before my internet decides to go out again, one of my personal favorite cues that you wrote, I think it was in Lesson Zero after Twilight cast the spell that sort of made everybody go crazy in Ponyville. And then she was kind of being reprimanded a little bit by uh, the princess. And there's this really beautiful music that goes on in behind it. It's mostly piano, this like arpeggio where it plays off of the major seventh and then it goes into the sharp five and, and then the five set. La, la la thing going on and i don't know if you remember that cue specifically but i just wanted to go ahead and bring that up that's always been my favorite piece of background music in the show and i don't know if you'll remember it or not but i just i love that music i i am not pulling it up right now i'd have to lesson zero was what what do was it this this year yeah i think it was the the third episode the the one after the discords oh god you have to realize that's a lifetime ago Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd have to go back and, and listen to it. But I understand what you, what you mean about the major seven and then the raised fifth. It gives it a magical sort of uplifting feeling. Yeah, it was so gorgeous and melancholy. And then it played yeah. off of the minor four chord a little bit. And yeah. oh, it's just it was really, really pretty. Yeah, haunting. Well, thank you. I'll go listen to it. A absolutely. You're welcome. Yeah, I can't sometimes week by week. Remember that cue? And I'm like, God, I don't. <laughs> Well, and I wanted to just throw out there real quick that uh, I think that oftentimes what happens, especially with the more dramatic scenes and the, the more action packed scenes or whatever, is that the music for the fans kind of joins with the animation and the voice acting and all of that in the scene. And so that the fans, when they think of that music, they're thinking of the scene. I'm thinking of, for example, in the first 
two episodes where the ponies are facing off against Nightmare Moon or the scenes with Discord. I think that maybe what you're seeing is that the fans aren't necessarily calling out the music to those scenes because those the music helps define the action so clearly and i think the music is the scene. The music is the scene exactly and i think that's where sometimes these simpler you know synthesized tracks stand out because in that scene the music almost transcended the scene because it was more interesting to the viewer that's just my take on it interesting take and I think that you and, and your assistants and then also when Daniel Ingram does his compositions, you guys all have done a masterful job of creating music that can accomplish that, to have that kind of effect on the animation and the voice acting. And I think that's part of what draws people into the show. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's been a nice sort of confluence of, of factors, you know, everything, everything just sort of like came together for the show. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that also addressing the issue of how many bronies there are, and specifically how many really creative artists and writers and musicians, I think that the show is executed on such a in such a flawless way on every level, from music to the storyboarding to the writing. I think that naturally attracts artistic people. I think that artistic people are attracted to the show, and I think it's just great and a testament to the talent on every level in the production staff. I don't know if we're flawless, but I will say this. We all bust our butts. Nobody here yeah. is taking a paycheck. Everybody at Dick and Rogers, at DHX, speaking for myself, I mean, we bust our butts. I don't know anybody that's just phoning this in. Well, and you can really tell. I mean, honestly, you can. The quality of the show and the, and the quality of the audio for the show is just fantastic. That doesn't happen by accident. So my congratulations to you on it, because it, it definitely... Very well done. Yes, very well done. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so I guess before we wrap things up, I wanted to ask you really quick if there was anything you would like to see from the Brony community. And I ask this of everyone. It's somewhat of an evil question, because... It's such a broad it question. It will happen. But yeah. Whatever you ask for will happen, That's especially right. Especially from the musicians. That's right. <laughs> Wow. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have any, um, I, you know, I mean, it's such a huge living organism. What do, I mean, I'm, I'm in awe of, 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 of the brony, brony world. I, I, I don't know, you know, I'm, uh, I don't know what to ask. You, you caught me by surprise <laughs> here. Yeah, like I said, it's a bit of an evil question. Is there any kind of musical anything that you would like to see the bronies produce? Or is there any kind of artwork that you would look for? No, it's, you know, it's all been <laughs> done. Community out there is huge. When, like, you know, I go to Equestria Daily or DeviantArt or, or whatever, and I look at everything that's being done, and I'm just sort of like, God, there's thousands of people writing great music, and there's all these beautiful fan art being done and people writing stories and i have my little corner of the world and i just take care of it and i don't have anything to ask for <laughs> just a fellow fan i guess yeah that's great that's awesome okay all right well william anderson is the composer for the scoring music for my little pony friendship is magic thank you so much for joining us today thank you so much for having me and i'm final draft and this is mando pony and stay tuned.